Hello everyone, today we talk about Numidian tactics, so we're gonna give a look to how the Numidians fought, both on horseback and on foot, um, as, you know, Numidians are mostly famous for having been, um, as Livy put it, puts it, the by far the best horsemen in Africa at, m back in the day, um, the, um, but they were also flanked, m often, by, by infantry, not of, m probably of such an excellent quality, but we were going essentially to to observe more broadly what this means in the context of the of the uh, Numidians. So as also the same uh, Levy uh, states, the Numidians relied chiefly on their uh, cavalry. Mm -hmm. And um the uh, the Numidian cavalry, this Numidian jacketators were essentially the uh, bit of the symbol of Numidian warfare as such. Um there were these are traditions that in North Africa existed for for century mm -hmm. for centuries that uh, had even in, in later Roman times uh, a great importance. Today we were gonna stick essentially to up to the late Republic uh, as as a t uh, Roman Republic as a timeline, so we're gonna I'm not gonna venture uh, beyond. But actually, the Numidians and 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 the Moors that also were pretty homogeneous at this time in terms of um, you know of tactics um, were to be part for mm, also the numeri of the uh, Roman army in later times. Um, <coughs> the Maurian um cavalry was quite praised you find still find it at the times of Justinian and the reconquest of, of the west incidentally i made uh, a video some time ago about the battle of mammus mm -hmm. uh so this clash that occurred into uh, sixth century africa essentially uh, between the byzantines and the uh, maori or, or the moors as if, even as you prefer that it really tells uh, tells a lot about what, generally speaking, the tactics of these um, peoples really were. At that time, they were rendered um, a bit more uh, dynamic uh, by the um, seemingly by the import of camels into um, into North Africa by, at the end of the, of the Romans. Actually, um, here's the title: Battle of Mamis, uh, 534 A.D. Romans versus Berbers. Um, at the time, at this time, instead, we're we're talking about in first centuries before Christ, camels did not seemingly were not used, and at least we have no no evidence of them uh, into this northwestern African warfare. But for the rest, um, a, a very important part of understanding this local warfare is, according to me, to understand how homogeneous and simple in the essentials it really it really was. Um, in many ways. So, starting with cavalry, that is, uh, as we were saying, a bit more economy, uh, Numidians were particularly famous um, uh, for it, as we have just said, and as uh, Sallust on, um, in the Jugurtines War, this work um, about the, uh, the clash between the, the Romans and, and the Numidians um, <coughs> in the at the end of the second century BC mm, states that mm, these mm, cavalry units operated in half a third groups mm. so their um, essentially their mm, thing was to harass the enemy constantly um, in um, in a um, in this fashion that could seem in fact half a third and mm, probably a and seemingly uncoordinated, but that according to me, uh, also similarly to, to other populations of the ancient world, was probably instead um, not really so um, disordered or um, illogical. Mm. On the contrary, I personally believe that these were mm, shocks, or uh, well, shock is a term probably best used for, for heavier cavalry, also in other contexts. Uh, in history, that use exactly this this term to define it, but um, I'd say these th th small groups mm, that operated probably on some sort of mm, clanic base. I just guessing. Um, I know that North African societies at this point weren't so stratified, weren't so um, uh, you know mm, so. Uh, cohes mm. so that there are other hints that we will talk about later also about the the cohesion of the um of the Numidians uh, while 
especially when they were routed, you know, they seemingly uh, all fled on their own way. They didn't remain; to, to, they just just ran and ran for days and didn't even care about coming back to see what was happening. So the picture is of society, uh, first of all, a very materially poor society. In many ways, these were uh, desertic areas of um, <coughs> of today's North Africa. Not entirely desertic, semi-desertic. Some, some actually were also fertile, especially around the coasts. But these were populations of the in fact of the hinterland. Mm. The coasts had been colonized by the Carthage, so by the Phoenicians, that had created um, Carthage and expanded their control over the main coastal cities. Then the Romans arrived. So these were populations that actually never also mingled ex um, particularly much with the um, local. Um, and Numidia was a kingdom at a point, even though for most of its time was actually a um, sort of cluster of little kingdoms that were pretty much autonomous on their own, that they never reached a full unity of some sort, but at a certain point they began to expand also toward the coasts. Uh, there was definitely a process of um, political and social hierarchization, I don't know, say the stratification, verticization, that brought to certain leaders to, to have a greater influence on the whole Numidian people, um, but they still were pretty. Mm, they were a pretty fragmented population, and when the Romans actually conquered Numidia um, uh, at some point, but um, as you know, Roman rule never went too much in depth um, into the interland in these areas. The Romans expanded essentially as much as um, they could mm, replicate their own um, colonial system, uh, also in terms of urbanism and so on. So we're these in Numidia was somewhat uh, fertile in certain areas also in the interland and that's the reason why certain centers had began to, to rise take Sirta for instance um, or uh, there were other centers that, but they say also Roman Numidia would have its um, centers especially concentrated in the north along the coast and from the let's say the uh, not in the mm, because there are also mountains in the middle that separate the coastal area from the desertic one, so this was practically the watershed. Excuse me, I drink a little bit. So just this for saying that, also if you look at the map of the Roman Empire, indeed, the Romans went way more in depth uh, into Central Europe. Mm. They seized areas that they deemed to be enough convenient to, to keep to control with a permanent presence. North Africa indeed was uh, had a, um, a much a thinner, was represented a much thinner stripe of Roman. And this doesn't, uh, Roman territorial domination, this doesn't mean uh, that, uh, I mean extensionally speaking, but it doesn't mean that the Romans didn't control the interland. It's simply that these populations were were definitely influenced by the Romans. Some of them actually got Romanized and were people coming from all over North Africa also to participate in the Roman state. But it kind of remained most of the times for strictly environmental reasons that influenced their political and social organization pretty undetached. The Romans didn't need to go there into these. Um, they launched certain, actually certain offenses, for instance, even against the Garamantes that are n were pretty much in, in depth into North Africa. Uh, but that you know, uh, didn't leave any permanent Roman domination for, for long. Sometimes, however, for Rome it was enough just to launch these offensives and to have this deterrent power represented by the legions. And even these small, say, proto-urban or even the urban sometimes centers of North Africa, you know, had no interest to risk it uh, to be raised to the ground by the Roman legions that at these times were able to storm even some of the practically all the best fortified cities of the ancient world, so they just stayed there. And these populations began just to harass the Roman borders either as brigands, so not a very, um, what Lutwak improperly would call uh, low-intensity offensive. Um, it's not really, you know, it renders the idea, I think, uh, though conceptually speaking there is something wrong with this definition uh, in terms. Um, um, but uh, in fact, the Romans at this point um, mostly fortified their southern borders with certain avant posts and um, 
even certain ditches and, and trenches, nothing more. Something that was enough to stop cavalry, um, <coughs> or at least uh, to you know give them time to to have to break these fences in order to go on and in in time for the uh, local garrisons to be um, to to intervene and to um, and to eventually choke them in, inside the Roman border in this sense because uh, this had theoretically open a gap and if they wanted to escape somewhere else uh, they they had to open another one so this was the main tactics the excuse me the main strategy that Romans used eventually uh, along this border and initially it was nothing like this um, as you can realize the I, I'm not aware of a Carthaginian border as such the Carthaginians were mostly um, that definitely had an influence as well on on the coast but uh, excuse me in the interland from the coasts but um, <coughs> the you know, it was much easier to deal politically with, than militarily with, with these populations at one point. And the Romans fought a ferocious war into the media. Um, I realized we might have to talk about Roman history a bit more uh, directly on Schwerpunkt. Um, as um, actually the Numidian war, the, the Jugurtine war, is um, um, probably. Um, well, at already at the time, the Romans were not interested in this land. Essentially, it was like, uh, like um, in many ways, there are analogies you can trace with uh, um, the wars in Numidia or in Spain, like the Roman uh, Vietnam, in, in some ways. Uh, especially considering what the, the Roman population was really, um, uh, what, what the reaction of the Roman population was towards these lands. But oh no. It's obviously an approximation, and there are other reasons that, in fact, now we can't discuss without, you know, stopping to talk about the Numidians and talking about Roman, Roman history. But it's there is a bit of, of Roman history indeed in here as well as the Numidians fought not just against the Romans, uh, but also into the Roman armies as it was um, at the time. So I, I think um, it, it's um, Numidia is a bit overlooked mm, as a um, as a as an ancient um country um and the, the really how important it was actually for Rome in, in many ways um so going back to the tactics as was saying this what what really impressed even include these um populations of the Mediterranean like the Romans or uh, the Greeks is that indeed the uh, the if you want the the lack of cohesion of, of of order of these formations, but actually when you have skirmishers of some sort, you have these essentially these swarms that go back and forth and harass you. And at that point, it's not even important to have. It's important to have a sort of cohesion hmm, that probably lacked because this um, there is an important distinction that has to do. Um, that we have to do in ant for ancient cavalry. So a few people um, realize that sometimes th the problem of collective training and how much this could affect the, the world tactics by themselves. Because um, collective training is not something you can impose all the time. I mean, uh, an army that doesn't have collective training, is that it's not that it doesn't have it because it's bad or, or they're stupid or they can't. It's simply because their politics and society didn't make uh, that feasible and therefore they had to cope with that in different ways naturally every army has a sort of cohesion and naturally the Armenians probably also some had some consistent cohesion but certain um, cavalries of the ancient world were actually praised mostly because of their availability and not much because of their inherent quality a lot of people believe that uh, I mean in their inherent um, collective um, 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 uh, ability and many people in fact um, say you know well these were horsemen so, so they have to be necessarily good horsemen or that I don't know Celtic cavalry for instance that also dealt with the Numidians at some point would say later was was good simply because the the Gauls had a lots of cavalry so they, they had to, it had to be strong no actually not the there were very few populations in the ancient world that had uh, um, very highly collectively trained uh, cavalry and these were definitely lacking consistently into Western Europe and Northwestern Africa. Um, and the reason being, their societies were not cohesive enough. There was no um, central authority that could impose that discipline and to make these formations work in a more orderly fashion. Nevertheless, um, this is not even true uh, completely because certain of 
troops could be naturally be better or worse trained and we have to distinguish this as well for instance if you take the Numidian cavalry that fought at Cannae or, or Cannae as you will prefer wh which uh, pronunciation you prefer you realize these guys m were able to to do three consecutive charges mm -hmm. so you can't absolutely talk about a low collective training for them but those were mercenaries those were mercenaries and veterans that had been with Hannibal now for, for some time uh, if they were mercenaries presumably they were already quite skilled people so it really depends who you really pick but otherwise there are other um, episodes in to which also f um, also in the um, um, in the during the uh, civil war um, of, of Caesar that you, to which you s uh, you see that the um, Numidian cavalry could be uh, broken even by a relatively few um, number of um, of Gallic cavalry in that in that context um, because you know evidently they didn't have this enormous cohesion so the problem with these populations is that they all fought like that and that in in this sense is a mass um, you know in, in terms of average naturally not all these uh, cavalrymen could be so effectively trained as as you know the elite um, and this made them excellent individual cavalrymen because these people lived in, in such fashions there are probably certain environmental reasons to brought to to this in the sense that you know reaching faster certain areas especially in a desertic situation where there are a few uh, place a few fertile areas so you need to 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 be speedy even in 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 movements in in certain um you know the way of dealing with the territory and having uh, this um greater ability to to move also these were not even fully sedentarized populations there were different um uh, layers of uh, you know some of them some of these the the Numidians were noblemen who lived into centers like we can talk about urban centers or proto urban centers that um were especially put in, in um, alongside this uh, trade routes of the Mediterranean so there were trade centers over which this nobility um uh, controlled um the the traffics and could also benefit of the materially from it so even being better equipped having armor and weapons coming from from elsewhere uh, the Numidians had a very few armor actually none at all just the noblemen had in this was a very uh, an exception and usually not heavy because this even the the uh, noble bodyguards were tended to be extremely like extremely dynamic still made of skirmishers that could have this or that armor preferably in certain organic material and maybe a helmet that is naturally essential but that was pretty much it in terms of armor probably some other Numidians were herdsmen mm -hmm. and others were simply hunter-gatherers still at the time so actually the bulk of the Numidian army was uh, coming from these poorer areas mm -hmm. uh, or at least but not necessarily poorer maybe the bulk came from mostly from the herdsmen from from those who already had enough cattle and and that could provide them to you know also a certain extra time and resources to to train and to um and to mm, spend their their life on horseback um interestingly the Numidians didn't um were famous also not to um use any uh, saddle nor bridle mm -hmm. this is also another thing that tells you you know that about the roughness of such um of such populations and uh, and how primitive these were this is something similar to what you find in germany in in, in europe for instance at the same time it's um a very tough world a very tri a tribal world essentially and, and therefore also a um a world where there is a lot of small mm, say small wars um, I among uh, b these um uh, tribal units for essentially for raiding cattle and seizing the most fer fertile areas but they are usually on a small scale so the world Numidian um, world was not highly organized. It wasn't anything, you know. It was difficult even to raise armies, as we will see. Um, the na national levy was something extremely rare. It happened, I think, only only twice uh, in twelve. Uh, excuse me, in two hundred thirty, uh, two hundred three BC, Sifax 
armed and mounted certain peasants, uh, peasants at his own expenses, and it was definitely an emergency uh, measure. Um, and the uh, he he theoretically, uh, you know, he evolved the intention of calling up every single man of military age in the country. But this was not obviously. First of all, there is no e evidence of pre of previous um, measures like these and um, the the only um, other national levy we can attempt a national levy also because talking about nation in here is also pretty difficult was uh, done by uh, Jugurta in 109 BC so one century afterwards where eventually and they were fighting with with the Romans so this is um, this was, was rare and was no substantial organization maybe well, in another video we'll deal more specifically on the organization of the Numidians as such but it's still important in order to understand tactics so also today we can um, discuss it a little bit um, this all for saying that um, and, and by the way these the, these sovereigns of the media that arose especially when um, interacting with the either the Carthaginians or the Romans, uh, they began to you know to to get a bit more mm, civilized in, fa in fashion. For instance, there were seemingly the Numidians were um, civilized enough at a certain point to use bolts um, and um, siege we uh, uh, siege weapons uh, at least for the defense of the cities these were that had conquered especially along the coast it was more civilized so there was a process of this aristocracy to tend to expand also towards other directions naturally the second punic war was a major um uh, watershed also in numidian history incidentally for what it happened for the um enga engagement of the same numidians other in on in um, the carthaginian and in, in the roman affairs and eventually when when the romans conquered uh, North Africa, they uh, they definitely engaged and uh, uh, entered into a relation with these peoples, and this was important because also from a political and social point of view, this mm, s brought to the rise of certain chiefs, um, certain kings we can call them, that were in this sense more easily controllable than all these various scattered tribes, and therefore they they could create. Um, their authority could create less problems eventually also at the borders with the, with the Roman Empire and saying okay let, let keep you I, I, I give you some power as a local king and in exchange you keep your people um, as long as you can at least um, obedient to Rome obviously there were there was always a very ferocious competition this happened in all the um, the uh, naturally all the countries that were so fragmented politically speaking this this is what happened also in germany for instance uh that yeah theoretically there were cer cer certain kings were allies of rome then other tribes uh were uh, by default um against them because they had different interests so maybe they sought um the same um to to reach the same role but uh and to be maybe protégé of the Romans themselves, but in order to do it, they had to fight against the protégé of the Romans themselves. So it, now it's a bit more, naturally the whole thing is a bit more complicated, but it's just to give an idea of the fact that even the contact of these populations um, with with the m more advanced civilization of, uh, of the Mediterranean brought their societies to change. Mm -hmm. And as we were saying before, also the Dominions were deeply involved into other wars that the Romans fought. Uh, if you look at the Macedonian wars, for instance, you find the Dominions were always um, with, with, on from the Roman side. Dominion cavalry, Dominion elephants, uh, also Dominion infantry. Jugurta had fought with uh, in the Numantine War uh, with, uh, back in the day in Spain for the Romans. Um, the the Dominions figure also in the in the in Caesar's invasion of Gaul, and as we were saying also before, uh, the uh, they would remain as, uh, as numeri in the Roman army for 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 centuries actually till the very end, arguably also because the Numidians uh, kind of a certain point Numidia was conquered, so even the names of these populations are kind of associated sometimes with that particularly the particular political um, um, entity rather than a well-defined 
identity that is otherwise pretty pretty foggy to 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 draw so all this for saying that the more definitely um the Numidians uh, got got a centralized society the more they assumed also into their armored forces certain other characteristics of some sort for instance uh, seemingly in uh, the, the first infantry recorded um in um uh, in use of the Numidians was when the Romans sent in 200 um 13 BC this um uh, embassy that with military advisors that uh, reformed somewhat the local Numidian army on you know on on, on, on Roman can say models but principles you know creating this more decently trained uh, infantry that even if it was useful also for these local kings to to storm certain centers and you know with cavalry you can't storm much uh, uh, if it is fort mm, you know if it's even more than a bit fortified so um there were many political interests revolving also the, the kind of organization of this um uh, of the Numidian forces because um a greater organization like this even changing the traditional warfare into something more framed something more trained equated also of you know having someone who could lead this um troops so that was conferred especially from the external like by the Romans or by the Carthaginians, a, a greater degree of, mm, a higher degree of power locally in that could build something was more structured, also politically speaking, than these scattered tribes that had a very low cohesion. So talking about the cohesion in, in the collective training, indeed, this had some, some influence, because otherwise the, the average Numidian cavalry would be um, rather pretty disorganized in this sense but when you are on the battlefield indeed this this is still relative because having this con constant rain of javelins coming from these horses that basically uh, horsemen that never stopped to to come there and just harass you everywhere trying to f outflank or surrounding you it's something devastating mm -hmm. and this is the typical tactics of ex of light cavalry the the normal um um Numidian's uh gear equipment was uh, excuse me in, in Numidian gear was a basically being naked just wearing a tunic so no armor uh a javelin that would or that could be practical also the same lengths that they could use eventually to charge because the Numidians yeah they tried to uh, uh fall back and retreat when they they were they were charged so that they couldn't be reached and and and, and this is what they uh, basically did all the time and it's devastating because in the meanwhile they keep uh, harassing you but indeed they, they could also charge because the the idea is that uh, no matter how light is your cavalry is it is still cavalry it's still um, frightening and this is also very overlooked as a concept in general it's not a uh, uh, you know, skirmish cavalry is light. Uh, it's fresh water, like in terms of charge, and you know, it doesn't make anything. It can still, especially if you have been harassed constantly by this rain of javelin, and you're exhausted, you're wounded, you're disordered, um, and you know, those are still mounted uh, warriors that can attack you and that can be devastating, especially if they surround you or they outflank you and something like that. So. Mm, Theoretically, the javelin could work even as a um, as a lance for a charge. Naturally, it wasn't it wasn't a terrifying charge. This wasn't it didn't have the same effect of the heavier Hellenistic uh, cavalrys that existed at this time. Sometimes charged with the contours, even with humble hand grip, and you know with this um, partially armored. Uh, even horses and and uh, and and cavalrymen. These were light troops that could make their effort, especially if launched at speed. But that probably during the charge mostly relied on the mass, on the scattered mass. Especially when your enemy is exhausted, and you find this even in Roman manuals in later times that it tells you it doesn't matter even to have an order uh, in order uh, to charge, but just to do it on mass and very speedily so that you can scare um, the enemy this was um, I think uh, present certain 
Byzantine military manuals of the 6th century and there is a video made about this if you are interested because I get a bit into the technicalities of the thing in there the title is something like Oh wow, I wish I had all the videos displayed right in front and not searching for you. However, it's in the Roman Warfare playlist, you find it for sure. This is called uh, 6th Century Roman Cavalry's Battle Formations. They're pretty useful in this sense because the, as we were saying before with the Battle of Mammoth, also the, uh, the Romans now were using, were capable of using all the kind of tactics that existed and even the scattered Mm, charges that are, are were something the Romans probably found at the time also against the Berbers being in use and so this was the time when the Romans were still completely open and capable of assimilating um, every kind of uh, tactics and even to cope with it effectively because you know that uh, a charge especially requires theoretically to be very effective a uh, an order and you can achieve this order usually through you know a, pl a pre you know planned deployment so that it takes some time but sometimes you don't have the time for doing this so some it's better sometimes to charge uh, even without cohesion but just with speed and mass hoping that the enemy would break because that can really make the difference as well but as we will see the Numidians were um, sometimes able to perform these outstanding uh, maneuvers uh, just like I was saying before for the Battle of Cannae in there you have three consecutive charges so this that's a brilliant example of lighter cavalry that could even charge effectively and not only but also having the uh, level training of reform um, to launch three charges in the midst of uh, of a battle and of a f of a battlefield so and that's something that reveals an enormous uh, quality so these um, cavalry men was were definitely um, could really vary also in, in quality of collective training and and their uh, cohesion on, on the field. And these were among definitely the best cavalry men of the ancient world individually also. As Livy said, also the Moors were eventually, the Maori were famous for having this excellent individual cavalry even though they were mostly used and this is why I, I was stressing that even the cohesion and the collective training was something a bit exceptional because eventually they were used mostly for small warfare let's say for reconnaissance uh, think about you know Hannibal and during his campaign in Italy definitely um, owed a lot to his um, to his uh, light uh, cavalry for ex exploration and you know reconnaissance and so on so um, this is mm, you you need this cavalry for doing lots of things that uh, you can't do with your heavy cavalry mm -hmm. so arguably this was uh, these were units were definitely best used in all those maneuvers that were that are ma majority of make up the majority of warfare eventually during a campaign so between a battle to another the, the movements of the army for screening for scouting and and um, defending the rear or ambushing the enemy so all things that um, you can't do with and that these guys were perfect perfect at um, and in the this was the the deal so they arrived very close to you they threw their javelins and you if you tried to attack them they would simply uh, scatter themselves and avoid the charge mm -hmm. this was the um, you know be beyond um, you know behind these tactics there is a logic that can that is always perfect uh, in itself this you guys didn't uh, have this tactics tactics for no reasons because definitely also in here the, the objectively in the ancient world there wasn't a great deal of difference of um, so-called asymmetry you know armies were all 
somewhat similar uh, in the essentials. Naturally, we are very attracted as moderns in saying, okay, that, I don't know, the Macedonians had the fox, the Romans had the, 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 the manipular legion and the court and so on. The, these guys were also mostly about cavalry. Yeah, okay, but the essentials actually were the same because all the armies at that point had similar types of infantry in the essentials. Um, they had similar types of cavalry. It was, the, the functions were all the same. So, sometimes the these um, differences that we like to highlight were partly meaningless in, in, in the field. Um, there is, in fact, um, in, um, we'll say it perhaps, um, on other occasions that um, the uh, light cavalry could also charge um, a heavy heavy cavalry and emerge victorious. This is something that happened. It, there could be many reasons for it because um, you, you imagine that uh, this wasn't really the um, the average as um, uh, as you know, light cavalry should. It's not even meant to to charge practically heavy cavalry, but I on the field, so many factors can come into play, and you might wanna wanna exploit them uh, um, in in some way. Um, the and and vice versa telling the truth because the um and this is also another very important part of, of ancient warfare is that there was a heavy cavalry wi which was not meant to charge light cavalry because this was theoretically speedier and couldn't and, and, and would simply uh lure heavy cavalry away from some places of a battlefield and tire it down and so on. Instead we have battles like that's so also the, the use of the Dominions, uh, the, like the Battle of the Great Plains, um, where the actually the, you have this atypical uh, evenience in which the heavier cavalries are managed to 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 rout, to, to reach and 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 and, uh, and destroy the um, uh, the lighter uh, cavalry, mm -hmm. and some of them these would flee also for, for other reasons, maybe were strictly political, not really contingent to the um, tactical situation, um, but definitely there are many things that can happen on, on a battlefield that can go against what the manuals uh, say, in the sense that uh, obviously there is not, not such a thing like a manual, but definitely there is a doctrine for which you know, more or less, people know how to use their their own troops in the essentials. Yeah, okay, but sometimes the situations can change, and you find that um, so these things these things happening. Also, this usually happens the more um, the greater the formations are, because at a strictly small tactic unit, uh, small unit tactics, um, it's uh, you know the essentials are much easier. It's obvious that the light cavalrymen will. F flee in front of a more armored cavalryman, but the formations as um, are something greater, something also more difficult to, to, to maneuver, they respond to certain orders, so there are more things that can go wrong and unpredictable um, in, in an unpredictable way than, uh, than in uh, what the single concept of that um, cavalry's role is, is really man m meant for to be, you know, and it's so these things kind of happened. And the Romans, uh, as we've seen, for instance, the Battle of Cannae were defeated by these cavalries. Um, there were um, um, also numbers entering to play, but there were also vice versa other episodes. And generally speaking, however, at close quarters, the heavier cavalries had definitely an edge in the Dominions, and that's why they tried to. To avoid a com uh, to avoid the uh, clash uh, and just to skirmish and to retreat when someone would charge because they they knew that they they were normally disadvantaged at close quarters. In fact, uh, together with these um, javelin slash lances that the uh, the uh, the Numidians used, though they usually were equipped just with a small shield um, and small. I mean. Not necessarily small, but however, a pretty light one, and uh, 
you know something could uh, keep them man maneuverable and just like a, a dagger mm, for close quarters that could be used in many situations as well so this versatile blade that you can use also not just for combat but for other things for surviving out there in the wild and it was necessary for some for some sort of self defense but the point is that these um cavalries as well as the infantry as we will see were conceived for this eminently skirmish role hmm? skirmishing role and nothing else theoretically then they could still do many other things but this depended on the situation um so the um so there are many quotes like Polybius says could uh, that um how in fact uh, heavy cavalrys were usually put into you know mm, couldn't cope with with the enemy as these Numidians basically easily scattered and retreated and uh, afterwards actually wheeling round and attacking with great daring uh, this being their peculiar tactics mm -hmm. so this is normal you just create a sort of vacuum as long as the enemy advances and this is the best way to tire it down this is something that happened so many times in, in history military history um, especially when you know before firearms when the, the also the range was something that you know this hit and run tactics were kind of dying out you know especially pike and shot put an end to the also to do warfare of the steps at least of its effectiveness when confronted with this form of tactics here obviously th we're not talking about the steps we're still talking about a world that was pretty similar in the concept to it mm -hmm. and telling the truth this form of tactics existed all over the ancient world i mean the, the, all the peoples at this point had some kind of light infantry uh, excuse me light cavalry that did essentially this it's just that these populations were entirely specialized into this mm -hmm. and this derived as we were saying before from political social environmental reasons economical reasons that had made the Numidians shaping this um, developing this warfare and you know uh, adapting perfectly to the what the in, in, in terms of cost benefits the the situations would w the situation would impose um, the best tactics of the Numenians were also, as we were saying, ambushes. Mm -hmm. um, were ambushing, uh, so uh, concealing uh, its their units in either the depths of the ground or other terrain feeders. Um, North Africa, especially in certain mountainous regions, is it's quite well suited for, for such things. So this tactics were naturally uh, relying on the the uh, the effects of surprise and the ability of uh, catching the enemy hopefully also in a non um, combat ready situation so either they were on the march uh, you know not expecting maybe also equipped for warfare but not being deployed uh, yet for countering the enemy so however every army at the time kind of had this um, these types of units that you know whether or another d could could cope with similar mm, uh, you know in similar w uh, with the Numidian tactics I by simply operating in similar ways um, they um, for instance there are mm, certain famous um, episodes of also of, of charge in uh, of Numidian charges for instance the battle of of Zama the and the um, Massinissa's cavalry uh, charged into uh, Tikeo's uh, men when these were um, been this had been uh, momentarily disordered by the retreating elephants. So, yeah, you have a very light cavalry that is usually not suited for charging, but you find this um, disordered enemy that is um, therefore in a vulnerable uh, situation, and you evidently uh, um, uh, can cause great damage with it always think about the order of the formation you can have doesn't matter how heavy your or, or light your troops are but what is really fundamental if is if they stick uh, 
together effectively if they can meet the enemy frontally if they are prepared because it, it takes a very few disorder to lose uh, cohesion forever and that's how you, you you lose a battle you can argue that uh, probably most important tactical principle is this one order mm -hmm. order naturally requires also training uh, a certain quality so that can go usually along with with other um, you know characteristics of the units but even the best unit can be wiped out by relatively small force uh, if it is disordered and therefore cannot uh, cope effectively with, with the enemy so this was one of the cases for instance um, the um, the uh, as we were saying before the Numidians were also best suited for um, pursuit as this is what light cavalry does when when you know the majority of the deaths in this um, these battles occurred uh, during uh, during the retreat during the poor so actually yeah um, ancient warfare was plain butchery telling the truth but um, this in fact happened not much during the the actual combat but only when the enemy was broken and you could send your troops in so the best troops for uh, carrying out such slaughters were definitely these lighter ones and these have always been in history mm -hmm. also in here when study ancient history, medieval history, modern, it, it's always like that. There is always a lighter type of troops that were in fact preferably also taken from the uh, from other countries that had a society and a, and a, and a military that were best suited in, towards that. For instance, the Romans used prominently these northern African uh, cavalrymen. In medieval Europe, in feudal Europe, for instance, the, especially in Eastern Europe, the um, nomadic peoples of the steppes were usually called to, to cover that role. So, at the end of the battle, your heavy cavalry is um, exhausted, and even if it wasn't, actually it's not the best choice in order to, to pursue the enemy, because caval heavy cavalry is... Uh, is usually slower. It's um, also pretty cool. So it it, it 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 tires down to to, to pursue and and especially um, if it if it splits uh, for running uh, after the enemy, it's also pretty. Um, you know, it kind of loses its uh, deterrent effect. It also can be, I don't know, during the pursuit can be ambushed. But because sometimes there were faint flights, uh, for instance, and so on. So it was better not to waste that type of cavalry, even if it had been completely fresh, which was rare, because these battles usually saw the commitment of the wall, um, of the wall units, as ca uh, battles are usually fought between um, forces that are kind of mm, similar, otherwise it's you rarely come to battle, so you're kind of... Uh, engage everyone so this light cavalry even if it was exhausted itself it still had this characteristics this f um, uh, quality to to go around after the enemy and butcher it down so that's when a um, especially the dagger from horseback or, or even the same laxes actually could turn out useful to um, to massacre the enemy you don't massacre the enemy throwing javelins. I mean, you can do that, but preferably now it's uh, plain butchery with your knives and your daggers, whatever you want to use. And naturally, a light cavalryman uh, runs faster than, than an infantryman. Also, these infantrymen are exhausted because they're fleeing, so they can't run forever, and they're tired, they're shocked, they're brutalized and traumatized by the outcome of the battle, so they're, they're in despair. They're quite easy praise and you can slaughter them like this so um, as Polybius puts it um, the um, the Numidians were in fact most efficient and formidable when uh, in pursuit of a flying foe mm -hmm. um, and there is um, something we were hinting at before this is kind of a characteristic element it's, it sounds kind of weird and, and I think it the sense has to be interpreted a little bit that is uh, this other, uh, I think it's always Polybius says in that once they, uh, the Numidians uh, give way, um, they continue their flight for two or three days trying to get as far as possible. And Sallust and something like, no Numidian after a route returns to his post in the king's army. Now, what does it mean? Does it mean that these guys 
simply, you know, being Numidians for some reason, they, they fled for days and not even coming back. It's obviously not. And, and Salus, um in this adds the specifically the fact that they don't return to the, uh, the Numidians, the, the fleeing Numidians do not return or rarely return. Um, uh, no return, uh, excuse me, no one of them, Salus says. Uh, but this can be an hyperbole um, in many ways, returns to his post in the king's army after a rout. Um, what does this mean? It me this means um, it's not that, in fact, the Dominion runs away just, you know, not to return anymore for, for some reason. It's simply that here it, it's mostly referred to the, politi to the low political bond that existed between the this king's let's say, and their uh, their troops. Um, because probably um, Dominions were fighting in in, uh, in groups that were under certain local um, chieftain. Mm -hmm. and, and these were the ones who didn't want the political centralization of the media, not even by a, a tiny degree. So the point is uh, what here the, uh, the classical sources are, are suggesting is that Practically, they, um, the Numidians were were extremely um, um, dissatisfied with the with the idea of serving for a king. Mm -hmm. So that when the battle was lost or seemingly things um, got wrong, they they used to to flee and go away like forever because um, the the political authority of their kings was so low that indeed they uh, when things got wrong they had no reason to risk their lives for them as they they wouldn't uh, they had great difficulty eventually to punish them to reach them in the first place and um, and this tells you how f politically fragmented the media was um, in this sense so it doesn't have to be interpreted as a form of cowardice, as the um, the uh, the source would would suggest uh, if you read them plainly, as if these guys just had to run. It's it's actually a, a way to say, okay, they they don't want to stay longer than the the do on um, the uh, on the battlefield for their for their chief for their kings. So as we were saying before, the Numidians were weren't just about um, cavalry. As a matter of fact, the Numidians, uh, since the end of the third century BC, began to train certain units, um, especially on the uh, Roman models. Also, the Carthaginians had uh, uh, infantry, but it was usually either mercenary, or it was just a tiny uh, body of the Carthaginian citizens. That, by the way, towards this time, practically. Uh, rarely appear as, you know, especially as a well-trained force. <coughs> Excuse me. On the uh, on the battlefields, and um, so the Romans were kind of bringing into North Africa kind of the heaviest and most effective infantry that were were known there. Uh, whereas in instead. Uh, their cavalry wasn't it's not that Roman cavalry was bad because this is also a very silly myth that exists about the quality of Roman cavalry that instead was pretty pretty high and actually the the, uh, the Romans had excellent uh, cavalry commanders that were even better than the, Numi the, the Numidian ones as they would prove during the Second Punic War um, but uh, as we were saying before, uh, this the, the Roman infantry was a very um, um, interesting model for the um, the Numidian chieftains um, uh, in order to mm, that we wanted to build a more consistent force that al also could cope and stand their ground against uh, this light cavalry that tended not to charge uh, this ordered um, and well-trained formations. Um, seemingly was a Roman centurion, Quintus Statorius, that in 213 uh, BC organized uh, an infantry force for Sifax, 
uh, very much like um, very much after the Roman patterns so giving them instruction to forming up maneuvering following the standards keep information um, and accustom them to the various military duties including fortification this is important and and all so successfully that the prince soon came to rely on his infantry no less than his cavalry this is particularly interesting especially the part of the for fortification because um, for light cavalry is uh, as for any cavalry you know fortification is something that messes up things because it obliges uh, them to to dismount in order to to cope with that so um, and uh, here uh, the source expresses how the uh, how Syfax was interested in this option and how uh, much he began to rely on um, on the uh, on on infantry. This actually was a bad thing for the Romans to do because eventually Syfax, as it's known, passed uh, to the Carthaginians. Um, but um, the um, and there is also the evidence uh, apparently that um, after some years uh, the same Syfax organized the foots in uh, their his um, infantry into cohorts and the cavalry into turmai or turmai after the roman example now here we she made a huge premise because people say what are cohorts in this context oh no there is surely someone who comes up well it was just marius who invented the cohort no not really the roman cohorts first of all as a name appear in very ancient times because actually the um, it was um, the um, the organic of the Italic allies of Rome in the in the in the infantry. Um, when the Romans didn't have the cohort as such as a name in the Ro Roman army, and plus, the term cohort is something that appears actually um, in Greek. Um, also here, there's a problems with the equivalences because it's Polybius that talks about this semi etc. However, in Scipio's army uh, armies during the Second Punic War. And the idea is that the, uh, as, at least as we know it today, and I, pr I promise I will make a, a very detailed video about this because it's very, very important to get, is that the, the Roman cohorts existed in the sense before, were being experimented at least from, perhaps from from the Second Punic War, and uh, the idea remained kind of in the air just for Marius eventually to formalize it. And this is simply because, and I will never get tired of saying this, is that uh, armies uh, already developed on their own. It doesn't take a reformer that one day, is, one day wakes up and says, OK, let's reform the army, let's change all the tactics because I'm a genius and I invented them f out of scratch. No, it's just the army that is changed by itself, already adopts the, the tactics regularly. And what you do is just to formalize, and especially in, Mari in the case of Marius, it was just from a political and sensual point of view. Uh, something that already exists as the military had already progressed towards that direction and uh, this doesn't mean to diminish Marius um, you know intelligence and ability but uh, also as a commander and he particularly dealt also with the Numidians himself um, that's where he was also with Sulla at the beginning in, in, into into service um, and the the idea is, however, that how uh, even the mm, how this Numidian chieftain like Syphax could organize his uh, army apparently on the Roman model it is kind of interesting. I would like to deepen the thing uh, uh, because I think um, it's important that a how as an example of how m more primitive populations are kind of less are kind of more open and more receptive um, 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 than than others as for instance the Carthaginians in this and this, the Carthaginians would have never reorganized their army on, on a Roman model because their society was completely different they had a completely um, um, they, they, they didn't stand this concept they um, uh, now I can't go very much in depth in here but the idea is that when you don't have an army proper because you have just this bunch of clansmen that you try to call up um, hoping that they have interests in common uh, interests in common with you uh, to participate to your um, un under uh, to, to go to war under your your guidance um, and you have the opportunity now for some reason because you're backed you're financed you're supported by someone so you have the resources to put up an army of some of some 
uh, I mean, to make up a, a an army of some sort, you you don't essentially rely much on your tradition, but you tra you tend to I imitate the best. Th at that time was the was the Roman army, and what is interesting in particular, according to me, is that allegedly he um, organized his cavalry units on the base of the Roman, uh, on the model of the Roman Turmai. Mm -hmm. So also imitating the Romans in their cavalry. That is very, very fascinating. Now I don't want to say more on article to this because uh, there are things that especially we, we, we don't really know, but um, I mean it's pretty meaningful that uh, a Norse writing people like the Dominions felt the need to organize this cavalry on the base of the Roman one that is allegedly uh, conceived to be not to have been excessively good at it but it's it's actually false and this adds according to me a, a little up to the actually to the quality of the Roman cavalry that is uh, shamefully um, overlooked um, and we know that actually after this um, these years, the um, but not always the um, uh, the infantry exceeded cavalry in the Numidian armies. Mm -hmm. In 204 BC, uh, Syphax had seemingly uh, ratio one to uh, five in terms of cavalry and infantry, um, um, even though um, um, there is a 60-70% ratio between that is kind of um, excuse me a 70 uh, excuse me 60 70 percent infantry uh, as a, an average um, the um, the use of, of infantry however was not really completely unknown in my opinion to infantry warfare before sometimes classical sources want to s they, they, they express very um, strong concepts like saying th oh, this thing had never happened before to stress how 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 um, what an impact uh, such phenomena had had on a certain system to to make it change, but it's pretty obvious that the Minions also uh, fought on foot before. Um, and this is pretty normal because, first of all, I don't think any Numidian could afford a horse <laughs> in the first place. Secondly, even if um, they they afforded one, there are certain tactical situations into which you necessarily have to fight on foot. Uh, we know the Numidians um, also fighting in uh, in sieges and so on, so they, they had necessarily to dismount and engage on on foot, and it was completely normal for any warrior of the ancient world to, even for those horse riding peoples of the steppes, to dismount at a certain point. We find lots of infantry even among the Scythians, why not finding infantry among certain mm, populations of North Africa? Uh, it's obvious that the uh, infantry has always uh, worked uh, like that. And how was this infantry? Well, practically it was the same thing of cavalry, but just on foot. Uh, the tactical function was was exactly the same. They were skirmishers equipped with javelins, with um, a sh a round uh, light shield, a, um, a dagger, and, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Um, and they did exactly the same thing, naturally with less mobility than cavalry because they uh, they couldn't run as fast as horses, but still being extremely um, uh, light and also difficult to catch, for the infantry especially. And there are many rounds, as we were saying before, into North Africa for which infantry, this kind of light infantry is pretty, pretty useful. Also these um, troops weren't charged, tended to flee to 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 at least to distance uh, to keep a distance with the enemy and to also to scatter and to run away. Um, and it's also very um, because when you when you essentially also want to pursue these troops, um, um, it's very risky, as we were saying before, to to open your formation, especially on this difficult terrain that can. Um, that is well suited for ambushes and so on. If you want to strike, let's say, it, it, with cavalry, it's mostly during pitch battles when a wall block of 
of hundreds with not thousands of men breaks immediately so they're still pretty close and you can simply run over them and 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 butcher them down pretty easily but when you have the scattered troops on the battlefield even if when they flee even when they retreat they're kind of uh pretty uh nasty to pursue because some of them can maybe regroup and attack you from from many sides especially if they're so scattered and you have to be very very uh, well cautious also because um your own, this would happen with your own cavalry uh, and uh, cavalry at that time, whichever it was, wasn't something particularly heavy. So if you had an ultra-heavy cavalry, like a, a fully armored one, you could simply even say, oh, well, okay, you can get tired and so on, but still, I'm, we're pr protected and these guys have no chance at close range and even their javelins are kind of useless and they can theoretically come back with even with non-excessive um, uh, losses. But when you get... a normal cavalry the ancient world like you know with a coat of mail a helmet and a shield and that's it with no horse armor and so on it, it, you know getting this mm, surrounded by such troops is not a very uh, funny thing it can happen to you and and you most likely wouldn't even waste such so actually the best troops to pursue the Numidians were other Numidians and this is what you see now in the Second Punic War that the Carthaginians and the Romans made made extensive use of Numidians um, from both sides at least it was a lot of during the Second Punic War it was a lot of political and diplomatical um, uh, you know activity to bring this or that side from the side. Actually, Scipio won in North Africa because he managed to win part of the Dominions from his side. This was extremely useful, especially before Zama. Mm -hmm. um, so as you see, aside from the tactical, strictly tactical point of view, there are so many factors that can come into play that can alter the, the balance eventually. Um, the um, what else can we add? Um, um, uh, we were talking about infantry, yes, and I was saying that the... Um, um, unfortunately, we know very few about the quality of Sifax infantry, I mean the one that had been reformed on Roman models. Uh, these are just information scattered into our also pretty scanny um, ancient sources, so we have no detail much of how they were um, used. What we know is that um, the, uh, in spite some initial success against Carthaginian forces sometimes, um, Numidian infantry is mostly involved in very heavy defeats, so this, doesn't, this doesn't really speak for much for for their quality, and we can indeed see that you know you can't reform an army out of scratch if you don't have a solid base of some sort. Um, so this um, say Romanized infantry that the Medians used was probably pretty you know poor in quality. Sure, they could have Roman equipment, they could have Roman also some additional training and so on, but that's not what makes a uh, an army. W for making an army like the Roman one, you need a, a, a Roman politics and a Roman society, <laughs> which surely wasn't present in Numidia. So, um, also, let's abandon, in absolute terms, the stereotypes that, you know, it takes a weapon to win wars, because it never did. And um, it... Um, you know, it, a weapon can make the difference, an equipment can make the difference, but it, it has to be backed by someone else, something else, by a structure that if you don't have, you can have all the equipment you want, that's not going to make you win. The, the Romans didn't really win their... their uh, they, they, they didn't really conquer the world because they had certain types of weapon. That's um, that's a gross misunderstanding, actually. it's um, It happened in very different ways. And as in spite their equipment was perfectly fine, extremely functional, very effective on the battlefield, that's still not what makes a battle being won or lost necessary. You need some much else. First training, first cohesion, first discipline, then all the rest. And maybe that's not even uh, enough in, in many situations. So not even courage for, for, for what it matters. Um, so here, this Numidian... Um, Im imitation of Roman legionaries is 
you know, was probably not very successful for as we can imagine and after all from what we know I as we said before it was just a Roman centurion who went there and taught them so much so what can a Roman centurion do for the world new media actually into changing so sometimes as we were saying before Roman uh, excuse me a classical sources are a bit vague a bit ideal however they're quite interesting because they were seemingly pretty sensible towards this kind of um, um, exceptions of unusual thing that however are meaningful because still true this um, Roman um, military advisors that we can imagine not have been just a single centurion or who knows maybe there were more or maybe it was really uh, just one guy um, there was uh, aside from the results of this um, t new organization it's really about the fact that there was a, r a relation between in that case the Romans and the Numenians was a receptivity um, from the Numenian side where certain political interests um, certain uh, balances that had were, were changing within the Numidian society so these are important things to, to do seemingly Numidians at a certain point began even to hire mercenaries from other countries like uh, I think the Moors so they, they started um, hiring Celt uh, Celtiberian bodyguards it was also pretty also in here seemingly towards the um, you know towards the the later times uh, also more consistent armor seems to have spread especially to the new uh, this North African um, uh, monarchs uh, bodyguards but for the rest the traditional warfare North Africa would see practically no armor it would probably surprise to see how lightly armored they were and actually an armor they these um, troops were which also tells you objectively given the fact they were so renowned also for their abilities how it's not being armored or unarmored that really makes the difference. You can obtain certain results also by achieve, carrying out certain tactics and uh, all the populations of the world kind of developed the, their own warfare in the most kind of efficient way, the most ergonomic way on in, in essential lines. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that happen, uh, um, happened quite often indeed is um, um, seeing um, cavalry mixed with with infantry mm. given that um, um, light cavalry and light infantry do the same thing it was normal and actually many other contexts in in, uh, in military history to mix to mix them um, especially to make the light infantry support the uh, the cavalry so this could happen in many ways surely there were certain battle lines roughly um, especially um, probably infantry lines uh, under which the, the behind which the uh, cavalry could could shelter certain you know, in certain ways or simply to retreat and rest during the battle so there was this kind of thing but sometimes there were really uh, light infantry charging together with cavalry so even adding up to the firepower uh, at the same time and this tells us naturally that were certain minions that weren't by I mean, by default, they didn't, didn't fight them on horseback simply probably because they didn't have one. Um, and um, the uh, there is, um, I think, when you're on horseback, you're kind of comforted by having infantry around. You feel kind of more protected. You're more willing to charge because you know you know how you have some someone to fall back on. Uh, also, with cavalry, you can retreat more easily so uh, this inf having infantry there you can uh, add extra security because you have someone to, to fall back on um, so uh, the the interesting thing however is that the Romans when f uh, coping with the Numidians uh, during the Jugurthine War as Saldus of right uh, did the same exact thing and seemingly um, the um excuse me um uh, i got it wrong i actually saw this uh, suggests that the um that it wasn't so usual however uh, to to perform this tactics which we don't know this is just Salus saying it um i mean mixing cavalry with infantry 
but it, it was probably unusual because um, probably um, also in here it depends the tactical situation can vary in many ways um, there can be moments you you can't even have that infantry some you don't naturally most of the Numenians prefer to fight as we've seen in this uh, on horseback if if possible so also infantry is not all this um it can mess up the the battlefield in somehow yeah you can have this line under which you can, behind which you can uh, shelter but at the same time it's still an obstacle on the field and cavalry has a need also to to run in a, in a free open space so having also infantry in the middle is not so good because it can uh, hamper your your maneuvers and can be uh, of a problem so it's kind of logical however that the dominions prefer just to fight on horseback and and we know that um, Syphax cavalry was um, in here instead surprised when the Romans actually um, mixed infantry and cavalry as, as well um, the Romans also in here you see that um, um, were perfectly capable of adapting to the situation. They could um, deal with the enemy in a in a very uh, versatile and effective way. If you study the Second Punic War, r you realize that there was such a great dynamism, especially this the Roman Velikas uh, in Spain were uh, seemingly at this point also equipped with the famous. They, they got much more versatile tactically, and they were much more important in these tough terrains. Um, and they could definitely do things um, um, like supporting cavalry uh, as well. So, also these alleged um, sometimes we treat the Romans too stereotypically. We say, "Oh well, the Romans were just about heavy infantry, right? They didn't have light." And it, this is actually false. The Romans at this point were um, capable of providing such, you know, equipment themselves. Roman legionaries at all times in Roman history have been capable of you know, putting their their armor away and to attack as light infantry. Um, and uh, there were many situations when this was done, but since Rome now was expanding and using um, many allies, if, you know, if there was someone who was already very good at doing it, why not using it instead of using the Romans? Um, that also were now transforming a little bit from their tribal background into their to something more, you know, gentrified, so they they wouldn't they weren't even that eager to to go to war, um, pretty much. Also because they had dramatically impoverished the society, so they now, but so that's why also the Armenians were so um, widespread eventually into Roman armies after the Second Punic War because they began to essentially to cover these tactical roles and with all the political benefits that such the you know uh, this contingent serving to the Roman armies w would entail for um, for the uh, Numidian kings um, um, I don't remember which point it was making now but oh yeah and the versatility of also Roman Infantry, yeah, this this was actually a thing as well, and the paradoxically, um, yeah, I, I'm saying this because we there is a uh, at least someone in the in the West has this uh, idea of defeatism, uh, this defeatism for which I don't know, all the great civilizations have to lose uh, against guerrilla. And from a strictly military historical point of view, this is one of the greatest lies that have been told. Uh, I think this originated mostly with Vietnam and other things, and other wars that were conceived as, as such. I'm talking about the Numidians, uh, for instance. Now I think about uh, the War of Algeria, with the French fought in, in there. And basically the French eventually withdrew from Algeria for merely for political, uh, internal um internal political matters in France, but if you look at what the French were doing on the field against the Algerians, actually they were perfectly capable now of countering the enemy guerrilla and inflicting devastating losses, then eventually they were called off. Um, 
so and there are many other mm, examples even during the 20th century of of westerners successfully dealing uh, western armies successfully dealing with guerrilla um and people still fall into this delusion that i don't know the the the, the greatest uh you know the, the most advanced armies and so on uh, even there is this, this western uh, cliche attached to, to them you know it's the western armies that lose against this other kind of eastern or whatever you want to call them um, so these brutal approximations that actually make people still think that i don't know war is a sort of monolithic rule for which uh, nobody can change there's no evolution war is one of the most dynamic things one of the most um, also uh, in war you find some of the greatest hybrids um, in terms of culture and civilization and so on and, and what you see here in the case of the Romans they definitely struggled a lot in Numidia um, themselves that is that they, they were still however capable of adapting to this guerrilla and eventually they won over the Numidians uh, like eventually after many uh, centuries they won in, in Spain against the, the Celtic barons were resistance and it took them a freaking lot uh, but this was not due to the tactics this was to in terms of the political commitment um, what the political mandate was what did it take the Romans to conquer uh, Spain so long is it because they uh, you know, they they tried so hard. They could. No, it's simply because the the Roman politics was completely not interested about Spain or or the media. It was like certain wars that have been fought fought recently. People say, well, we don't simply don't care. So there is no commitment. There is no investment, and 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 masses happen because that society is not interested in in what is happening over there. Doesn't understand it, and therefore assumes that it's better to. To, to give up just because it's ah oh, it's too difficult but that's your fault because y you didn't look at it into it before the way you sh sh you would have had so they they use the excuse of defeatism by saying ah oh, we couldn't win that war completely false completely false you think the Americans couldn't win the Vietnam War seriously <laughs> oh, I mean we still live in these um, conceptions and sometimes um, I realize and also I'm schwerpunkt to um to to make to try at least to make understand how important is war for understanding our world and our politics especially as war by definition is really a tool of politics and nothing else so you can't blame war at uh, as such you have to blame politics as such for having not seen it through well and it's believe me it's very difficult to see through well so it's normal it's part of our struggle as human beings to have difficulties in, in seeing well through things and that's why we can't give up and we have to study military history because military history can tell us so much and can help us not really avoiding the same mistakes because also the myth that history repeats itself constantly is completely f a myth in fact um, history has never repeated itself not even once um, there are surely certain patterns that you can apply to history like saying you know, to interpret it in a certain way and saying in observing that there are similarities between certain things but I think even from a strictly civic point of view you know if you think that something is o happening over and over again you're just being mentally lazy and you're just essentially giving up the um, the ability of, of 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 researching of making history in this sense from the etymological point of view and and see and trying to see it through to to actually understand what it makes this thing unique and how to cope with it better and this is happening at all levels of politics indeed and looking at the um, at the past or or at the adversities and saying oh we're seeing it all before these are the usual bad guys this is usually wrong the usual wrong thing we have to do it because it's wrong. We will repeat the errors of the mistakes of the past, and then you realize that these people do not even know what the past has been, because they're just babbling about uh, things they don't know, and they presume they can compare without even, you know, having gone into them and having tried to, to understand them fully for the way that the way they are. Uh, knowledge is not a bunch of lines you can read on Wikipedia and uh, make a list, and yeah, you're done. You have to make your brain work, and it's very hard. Believe me, it's exhausting. I remember, you know, I uh, 
uh, I remember I realized every time I, I I learn something, my head hurts because <laughs> objectively, uh, it's your brain working hard and and I I'm not saying that I'm a particularly intelligent person, not even a particularly uh, educated person, but I um, at least for, for, for what I wished <laughs> I, I had been. But I realized that every single improvement I made in my life, it's when I made my wa brain work, when I realized that uh, I I believed one thing before and I was wrong. So then I had to not really start over again because that experience was already something more that I knew. Um, but really having to reformulate, to, to find other patterns, to, to, to see it through better. And history is always like this. Um, it's not really something you can... opinate on on the basis of your feelings or your emotions. You have to see it through. You have to make it work in a substantial way. However, we're not done with the Armenians yet. Um, the uh, relatively to the pair cavalry and light infantry, we just remember that um, Polybius, for instance, implies that Magus Ambus force at Trebia was cavalry and infantry alike. Um, and the um, and these were probably the median, as far as we know. And the um, there is um, here also pr probably a geographical distinction a little bit than the more relatively to the Maori that he named it, you know, Numidia, except the north, is a bit more of a flat land. If you go into places like Morocco, so you start the Atlas, so that, that's a more mountainous ground. So it's, it's seemingly the Moors, the Maori, the same better, that were um, pretty akin to the Numidians, telling the truth, they, their uh, royalty also intermarried and, and so on. They, they seemingly made um, a greater use of, of, of infantry than the Numidians. So this uh, also has to do with the terrain and what this could really be. Um, Appian, that is also a later source for the Battle of Zama, uh, states that the Maori in um, in the first line in Hannibal's um, army were at Zama, in fact, were archers. Um, and there is evidence, in fact, also in Salust, uh, that it says, you know, that they um there were bowmen and uh and slingers as well um so this is interesting because that added like a bit of a longer range of m missile firepower than the the javelin naturally the javelin at closer range has is kind of heavier more effective but also slings were a hell of a weapon as we know and also archers could could use it in this way um and the um, the, uh, the 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 Dominions use elephants as well, um, just like the Carthaginians. Not excessively often, because also having elephant requires a bit more of organization. It's not uh, this tribesmen feel that elephant was usually the Dominion kings. For instance, the Dominion king Mishipsa that sent some elephants from Rome. Um, in Rome, um, in in to to fight for Rome and Spain in 134 BC, where elephants and they had a complement of archers and slings uh, attached. Um, this was very important because usually elephants were um, were guarded. Um, you know, they were quite vulnerable from. Um, uh, because mm, uh, from light infantry, because the best way to take elephants down actually was one, only one. It, is, it was practically sticking a lance uh, literally in their backside. Uh, it, it sounds, yeah, I know it sounds horrible so because of the poor animals, but uh, this was actually the most effective thing. So th there had to be necessarily a guy that from the Roman side were usually uh, a velus, so part of the velitas, plural, that went there, stuck his javelin in, in the elephant's butt, and and actually for doing that, um, because that's the softest uh, spot, and the rest of the, the elephant's skin is pretty pretty coriaceous, and that's also what makes them, you know, formidable things on, on the battlefield. So there had to be a, a kind of unfortunate guy who had 
necessarily to to get around the elephant. And this is something extremely risky you can imagine. And and in order to counter this light infantryman, naturally the best option was having other light infantrymen. Um, so around these elephants, um, um, during the clashes here um, of the ancient world, usually there was a lot of light troops fighting against one against the other. Um, I made any. Uh, I think um, it's interesting if you're going to my Roman warfare playlist. Reads the famous. I made a video on the famous battle of Ilipa of 206 BC, um, uh, into which the Romans, uh, the Roman velitas coped with against the, uh, the Carthaginian elephants in, in in such a fashion. So if, if you're interested, and they were also tar being targeted by other light infantry. So. Um, that's kind of a context where such things happen. So if you are interested about the battle, I the battle of Lilipa is an extraordinary battle. If you learn about it, it's, uh, also Scipio's uh, tactics there are very, uh, very important to, to understand the evolution of, of Scipio's tactics. I, I, I promise I will make dedicated videos on this uh, uh, in the future. Because we're we're just at the, the beginning of of Schwerpunkt. I, <laughs> I haven't even began to talk with you. I have countless topics I can discuss. I I'm sure I I will not leave enough to end it. So if you are uh, I don't know if you are interested in my top in my in my videos, we're probably that's probably great news. Um. um yeah. So and. And also, also the, the elephant crews were Numidian usually, as we were saying before. If you see the the, Ma uh, the Macedonian wars, the Romans fought in in Macedonia with ex uh, substantial numbers of, of of Numidian elephants and and cavalry that were sent by their client states in North Africa. So, um, what else can we say? <laughs> We know also relatively to the numbers of the elephants in the Numidian armies. We uh, can, um, I mean, through the especially the aids that uh, they sent to the Romans, we can't figure out more or less what how ma how many there were into the Numidian army itself. Um, for instance, in 191 BC, Massinissa sent, uh, uh, yeah, kind of lent uh, 20 elephants to Rome, um, and they also. In Later times, the camp being important in, and for instance, uh, Jugurtha in forty-four. In excuse me, um, in the in at the end of the second century against the war against the Romans, um, had forty-four elephants. It's not a few, actually. Even considering the logistical needs of these elephants, that you need a consistent um, consistent are supply train for for satisfying these beasts. Um, and and, and Juba the first seemingly had in the first century BC had 120 elephants, the, so this is an increase actually, and um, this could suggest um, the. In fact, the, the 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 higher the process of progressive centralization of the Numidian state, especially under the the Roman influence. And I, um, elephants can be used in many ways, uh, also for as siege weapons. As the elephants, but you have to imagine, especially what the settlements of North Africa could be. Really, nothing very extremely fortified. The elephants can literally take the palisades and tear them off. You know, with their, with their, um, I don't know, you you call them the, in English, the proboscis, I believe. Um, So this was a normal complement um, in the Numidian armies. Naturally, you can imagine the, the effect of the charge of the elephant what could be. But also in here, that was something could be. Uh, you know, there were tricks to 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 deal with elephants uh, as well. Um, I don't know what I could add. I could add certain interesting aspects uh, sometimes of uh, comparing. Numidian um, cavalry with other um, with other uh, cavalries. For instance, um, 
in uh, during the um um the for instance when when Julius Caesar invaded uh, Africa in the last in the, the last time he during the civil war he um he was actually troubled by his Numidian cavalry mm, so it was kind of because you are, realize also the local traditions hardly change uh, we see that yeah certain now the Numidian kings were more powerful but essentially the, the world you know local warfare was pretty much genius all over North Africa and they it's not that these were massive changes structurally as in social engineering and so on but uh, however a very interesting thing about it is that during the <coughs> um, the 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 in this aforementioned African invasion is that um, Caesar had brought with him um, in his army certain Gallic uh, cavalry. And at this point, you know, the Gallic cavalry was used by the Romans and easy. Also, if you look at Cara in the, in the east, it crosses had its Gallic cavalry. It was pretty dynamic, per pretty versatile. And as I was saying before, also Celtic cavalry didn't have a, a huge deal of collective training, but similarly it was a bit different because allegedly um, 30 Gallic cavalrymen managed to fence off uh, to drive off actually a larger much larger force of Maurian cavalry mm -hmm. um, while um, one of um, uh, a squadron of, of Caesar's heavy Iberian horsemen routed a larger body of Labi uh, um, Labianus Numidians uh, um, so it seems that um, and at the same time, Gallic and Germanic horsemen managed to to stand their ground in in that episode. So it's it's interesting because it seems as if this um, Central European cavalry, the Iberian, the Gallic, and the Germanic ones, that at this time start also to appear prominently into the into the Roman army after the conquests of these regions, were actually a bit a bit tougher. On closer range than these um, troops. Um, this is objectively true because um, the Central European um, peoples, especially Celticized areas that were a, a bit wealthier on average, were definitely um, they had stronger cavalry, especially in terms of um, equipment. So it's not that we're necessarily better or worse than the lighter ones of North Africa, but simply um, they were able, they were a bit more resistant. They also had probably a different military status. Uh, the idea is that, especially Celtic cavalry, Germanic cavalry, I mean, Iberians, Celts, and Germans had this idea that they were warriors, individual warriors, they had to prove everything to their uh, to their comrades, to their, to their families, to their leaders, and Therefore, this idea of standing their ground, not giving up, of being mostly um, also ready to, to attack face to face, not to flee, because fleeing in this uh, Indo-European war was considered as a form of cowardice. And this, this, this North African cavalrymen were much more, you know, even different probably from a in in mindset, and they, they tended to fight in different ways. And similarly, such relatively few numbers of, of Central European cavalry that anyhow wasn't this big much as well managed to route much larger numbers of um, North African cavalry. And I say it wasn't this big much not because I'm saying these weren't good fighters. I, I, I'm always making it a point of collective training. I'm really <laughs> stuck with this. I mean, um, because that's it. We know that Central European cavalry didn't have a big deal of training, uh, of collective training. So individually, they were excellent fighters and and I think that's what the point is that here we're seeing cavalrys that were probably of equal collective training possibly actually the uh, well yeah probably equal but it, at that point it was the individual um, given this even ground uh, it was the individual prowess the also the better inc uh, individual equipment that kind of uh, made the difference at this time by the way uh, the Romans also tended to keep. Um, um, I'm not aware of 
North African cavalrymen were equipped with in a heavier fashion by the Romans. I think the Romans tended to you know, to regard the cavalry as best as extremely light and fast cavalry was no point of really having it that much. I mean I'm sure some Numidian auxiliary at a certain point wore uh, some Roman armor of, of, of sort, but I think uh, it, it, it's much plainer of evidence of um, Central European cavalry was given even not just Roman equipment, it's even Roman ca- uh, Roman horses. This happened, for instance, in Gaul with the Germans. Uh, at a certain point, Caesar takes this um, German cavalry men that were extremely good but they had horses that sucked because they were smaller and kind of and and he gave them the ones of the uh, his own uh, equites so it is pretty interesting so this kind of very intense war individually warlike nature of the the cell celts germans and the barbarians and so was um uh, was worth spending an armor and a good fighting horse um for close combat, actually. So that conceptually, these were troops you wanted also to be equipped in a certain, in a heavier way, and this perhaps explains also how uh, these mm, episodes of the civil war in in North Africa actually occurred. Um, I mean, this. Mm, bunch of um, Gallic cavalrymen managing to route a much larger force of North African cavalry. So that's it. And however, as we were saying, the Romans never gave up the uh, North African cavalry. They always had it in their armies. You know, the um, and this is very interesting because while the Gauls um, the barbarians uh, that kind of got eventually gentrified by the Romanization. Um, the Moors didn't. So they, um, I mean, I'm saying the Moors, I know it sucks as a definition, it's just say the Maori, it's but I'm talking about this Berber populations in general, the North Africa, they um, they remained more or less the way they, they, they were before. Because we have said Rom- the Romanization affected just the coastal areas where there were cities and so on. So the interland remained essentially the, was the same. And their tactics remained the same. So while the Gauls kind of lost their taste in warfare because they became eventually Roman citizens and they laid Roman Empire, Roman subjects, um, they kept, yeah, there were certain sacks of, uh, of resistance. Recently I talked about the Bagaude, for instance, in that video, Transformation of the West, uh, 3rd, 6th century, also deals in part with this kind of how Romanized were certain areas. So even of gold, it was one of the most intensely Romanized um, provinces of the empire. But um, generally speaking, this cannot compare anyhow with North Africa. It kind of remained a bit always on its own, substantially. So uh, the Romans camped ininterruptedly to use this light cavalry mandate that remained even to the Middle Ages, as there, as light cavalry uh, employed by anyone was ruled over North Africa as uh, auxiliaries and, and so on. So, uh, this was about the median tactics. Um, maybe in another video I will dedicate more thoroughly to um, to to the actual organization of the Armenian forces that today we hinted a bit at, but it could be a bit, mm, bit more precise, let's say. Um, and okay, so uh, this was mostly about Armenian tactics, and it's so easy to remember. Actually, if you have problems with this, naturally, I, I tend to add details to to characterize it a little to make the story a bit more interesting, but. Um, the essentials, you know, it, it's so simple. These guys were just light troops. They were just light skirmishers who fled when they were attacked and kept harassing you. Point. Doesn't matter whether they were on horseback or, or on, on, on foot. That's the standard Numidian army. And we would be surprised to see, in fact, how it was all about it. Even those things we said about the Romanized infantry, the elephants, these bolt engines, even used in, in the greater Numidian 
or at least the, the, the cities that the Numidians conquered, were practically insignificant. These were all skirmishers. Point. You could find some slingers, some some archers, well, of course, but they were homogeneous. We also probably would be struck to see how homogeneous they looked, in spite of having no degree of standardization ever, because practically they used all the same weapons, the same tribal weapons, the same tunics, the same thing. Um, and there were many other chapters actually very interesting in North Africa. I think N North Africa is overlooked um, when discussing uh, ancient warfare. Actually, we're, mm, it was simple as we've seen, but there were interesting. Um, it's kind of interesting to see how these more um, advanced civilizations dealt with the uh, local uh, local troops. No, no, just um, with the local warfare. I was just thinking now about another video that is not really about North Africa in proper because it's about the Horn of Africa. Um, it is an ancient warfare playlist and it is Ethiopian warriors of the Achaemenid army. And in there I discuss a little bit also how these guys were. Uh, Ethiopia had actually a bit more of a characterized and uh, warfare also they had um, but we're talking about very archaic times, so eventually also the, those areas of the world kind of evolved during Tegeti, while North Africa remained also a bit rougher. Um, Albeit it did change. For instance, I was saying before for the Battle of Mammoth, the, the Romans at a certain point introduced camels, and they that by the 6th century we see that among the Maori, this, the camel warfare was kind of pretty much there. Um, but there are other populations that are very interesting in North Africa. For instance, I still haven't talked about the Carthaginian army, which is also very um, is a chapter I'm very fascinated by because also in there a lot of wrong things have, s have been said, even by accredited scholars that you know exchanged. I don't know the the uh, the 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 Carthaginian javelin for a, for a Macedonian pike just because they mistranslated from a from a dictionary, from the Greek term for it, and all the other follow so historians followed, and, and people just think today that the Carthaginians had something like a, a Macedonian pikes. That's uh, that can give you the sheer level of ignorance of even of scholars. But it will be more detailed in other on other occasions. But it's very for, ins for instance, uh, it's very interesting to see the relation between the um, Carthaginians. And the uh, Libyans. Looking at also the survival of chariot warfare in some areas of North Africa, um, among the Garamantes, among the Libyans as well, uh, among the same Carthaginians actually, but that was at least in rather archaic times where, you know, chariots were used also by advanced populations like the like the Persians in that same fourth century. Um, and and by the same uh, cer certain Hellenistic powers as well, but with the chariots I'm talking about, they're not the heavier chariots of the greater, uh, you know, this more advanced civilization. But I'm talking about the tribal chariot, and what you see, it is very interesting. It gives you also a dimension of how backward certain areas were, more primitive they were. Actually, is the comparison between North Africa and Northern Europe at this time, because chariot warfare survived, had survived at this point in the first century BC, let's say in Northern Europe as much as in North Africa because these those were you know the war chariots something that entered in crisis um, in in the Mediterranean since uh, the Bronze Age essentially with the sea peoples that arrived they had this tougher infantry they managed to basically to 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 make a chariot war for crumble well this peripheral areas of, of of the world at the time the north and of uh, the north of Europe and North of Africa, they, they they were still keeping to use chariots in this tribal kind of heroic style warfare. Um, also, they they used that it with some effect. Really, uh, uh, there is nothing really wrong with that. It's that you have to understand the local, the local politics and society to understand why these were still used. And and even if they were outdated, didn't mean that. They were practically in effect. Mm -hmm. At least uh, with the Garamantians, for instance, the Romans struggled quite a while, and uh, they uh, 
Also with the Celts, they still use chariots sometimes, especially in the north. In, the, in um, I mean, the Belgians and the the Britons, they you know, it's not that it was always easy to cope with them. I mean, sure, they didn't, they weren't in great. Uh, well, the Belgians actually were pretty strong. The Britons, so so. Um, you know, it's not due to their ch chariots, but still it was a functional warfare that, as I was saying before in the video, you don't have to think of the ancient world so asymmetric. Um, I mean, with such great differences in in, in substance, because um, there, w there was no army at the time that had objectively a higher edge so that could always win. Indeed, uh, not even the Roman army that is often created. I've seen people who are uh, allegedly experts uh, on military history stating something like, like the Roman army was in conditions of symmetry the strongest army in history. I, I, I doubt that these people have uh, should even talk about military history in the first place. Um, and as you know, I love the Romans and I all much about them, so I. I consider this an insult to to Roman history proper. I know I say certain controversial things that I eventually I don't explain because I I want to leave for another video. But um, I have some points that I hardly hear around and pretty convinced of what I'm saying. Uh, and I like to be controversial because I like to make people reflect. I mean, if I say something that people don't like because they think it's new, they've never heard it, and they automatically think they feel threatened by an, a novelty and they, they have to tell you it's wrong, well, it's, it's still likely, however, that they will think about it and they will remember it differently for someone that just tells them their own version and that uh, doesn't make them work their, their brain further. So, on Schwerpunkt you will always find this kind of very straightforward talk, um, as I don't have time to lose with unnecessary um, uh, you know I, I don't need here I'm not here to, to please you <laughs> in the sense that I probably hope I that my, my videos are watched and so on but um, it's because of what I can tell and and, 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 and the effect that my and things I say can have on the audience not because I, I want to do it for me or for having friends or s and so on I want to say what I think is correct and because I think that that serves two people. So, um, for today, I was glad to talk about the Numenians, um, um, because, um, as I just said, uh, I think North Africa is brutally underestimated in uh, ancient, you know, in dealing with ancient warfare is actually pretty interesting, and there is a lot to say. Also, I'm planning to, since I, I see that many of you like Roman and Byzantine histories, that I will have to, to, to start in, into the cycle here of uh, my videos to, to insert also some Roman history, Byzantine history. I, I still don't know how to do it. It's not easy. Especially Roman, uh, well, because it's, it's a very long story, uh, <laughs> indeed. So, um, but here and there collecting some information is, I think it's uh, about that, is to give also a bit of background. And that, that's the point I want to do with Schwerpunkt, is I want to make lots of videos so that when I say something, there is always something else you can hear, um, some other video that, that gives a, big, a bit of background or that at least is linked to such topics in the first place, so that everything is easier also to understand and uh, also can give people more can get people more interested in these topics so for now I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye